I want to get stopped by them though. That's like my favorite show, and I don't know what I would tell them. What <laughs> you just go to them? Please, please interview me. Please, please. I need the clout. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to the Quarter Cutter Podcast. So today we go and talk to Amanda or Amandum on TikTok, where she goes and takes popular TikTok songs and translates them into Japanese, as well as creating cultural content around being half Japanese. She's garnered over 16 million views on TikTok, and she's even been featured on the Oscars. And you know what else should be featured on the Oscars? Smashing the like button. So make sure to do that and follow us on Twitter. Hope you guys enjoy the podcast. Peace. This podcast was brought to you by Riverside, which is a podcast recording service and what we use to record this interview with Amanda. So one of the reasons we really like using it is because it automatically syncs up everyone's video and irregardless of everyone's internet stability, it still records the video, even if they drop off. Riverside also gives a seamless Dropbox integration, which lets us go straight to putting it into the Dropbox folder after recording, which lets our editor Mudan go right to work and get the podcast edited. Yeah, and because it's just a link that we have to send to our guests to join, uh, it makes it easy and we don't need to ask anyone to... Uh, download any additional software, which is what we did before. So check out the link in the description for 15% off your own Riverside account. So Amanda, can you give us a quick background of who you are and where you're at today? Yeah, I'm a half Japanese, half American content creator who lives in Nashville, Tennessee, but also lives in Tokyo. I split my time between the two places and I like to talk about Japanese culture, flipping a lot of things from the English language to Japanese language to show people online and just create a lot of content about my culture and my languages that I speak. How would you rate your Japanese compared to your English? So English is my native language. I grew up on that. My my mother speaks English and Japanese, but my dad only speaks English. His Japanese consists of like konnichiwa, konbanwa, oishi, and like itadakimasu, and kanpai. So a little limited there. <laughs> so I grew up in my household only learning English, and I spent a lot of my childhood in Nashville, Tennessee. So I started off with English, so like that's that's my go-to. And I learned Japanese when I moved over here for about nine months to help take care of my grandparents when they were ill. I picked up speaking Japanese, like like street language. So I'm very good at street language. I'd say like very, very professional native, but my reading and writing is probably like honestly a third, fourth grade level, but I can hold a conversation well and work in a business environment. I'm sure like in America, you just, you just get treated as like an American, but like, what is it like in Japan? Do you get treated as? Japanese? In Japan, I think I'm not foreign enough to be like interviewed by like you and Anishini Boy, that show that stops at the airport. It's right. like, why'd you come to Japan? But I am foreign enough that when I'm speaking, like they'll, even though I sound pretty native, they'll still say like, oh, Nihongo ga jose desu ne. So I'm like in that weird hafu in between, you know? Yeah, I like the levels you put over there. <laughs> you're, 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 you're not foreign enough to get stopped yeah. at the airport. Things to aspire to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want to get stopped by them though. That's like my favorite show and I don't know what I would tell them that would be interesting enough for them to like want to interview me, but I'll eventually think of something. What do you just go to the please, please interview me. Please, please. I need the clout. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned being half Japanese and um, half American and like I guess diving a little bit deeper into that we talked to maxi capo maxi capo previously and he had mm. some of his own experiences being half japanese have you had anything specific that you're like oh man this only happened to me because i'm half japanese over here oh yeah i i think a lot of my experience is that i would go to something for example like swimming lessons in japan when i was like here and i would go to this instructor and i can like completely understand everything just like every other kid but they would try to be like a common Accommodating without asking if I needed it and would just start trying to speak to me in English and I would just get so frustrated because I'm like I understood everything you just said but like I will ask you if I need the help but like I'm just as like fluent as these other kids that are here and that would just happen to me all the time or like I'd be shopping for clothes and like people would come up to us and try to to myself and my mother and try to talk to me in English and it's like all completely broken and I'm like I know you're just trying to be nice but like I promise you don't have to do this. I'm luckier than a lot of other people like even just like the difference between Gen Z halfus and like millennials like they're a lot more accepted to just kind of be the norm than even just like one generation above me. When, when I was going to school here I was going to international school so it was just a bunch of halfus or foreigners anyway so I was kind of fortunately sheltered from a lot of weird experiences just because I was pretty involved in like the the foreigner community but 
definitely not completely blocked out. <laughs> yeah, I guess on the flip side of that, have you experienced like perks of being Hafu? Like, oh yeah, about that? being Hafu is just like, oh my gosh, you can get so many random benefits out of it. Like, so they'll think that you're just like visiting Japan because you like it or something, and they'll give you like a lot of omake sometimes at like different stores, or like they'll they'll treat you better because they want you to have a better experience because they think you're like. A guy Jean that's just like experiencing Japan for the first time. And when I was little, I used to get so I used to get so excited when modeling people, like agents, would stop you and be like, "Would you come model for us?" Because I like I was like a little kid with like curly hair, and they were like eating that foreigner like look up. And my mom be like, "No, she's not interested." I'm like, "But I am." But she's like, "No, you're not. That's a scammer." But <laughs> it used to be a lot of fun. But it's it's died down a lot since. Now I feel like they just see me as like a normal person. You gotta get back to the celebrity vibes right there. <laughs> I guess yeah, that's why but... I started TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> this is the origin story right here. The, yeah. the people in Japan stopped. They, they haven't stopped me in a while. Oh, I gotta get on TikTok right now. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. So I guess like, have you seen any ways to like strategically go and use that? Because of course, like you can get get those perks, but. I mean, it's, it's probably only you want to do it like sometimes here and there, right? And then go mm -hmm. play to the, the Japanese side other times, right? I honestly kind of just stopped relying on it more so on the Japan side. I've like, right. I feel like people see me as more Japanese as I get older. And I guess as times change, so it's a little bit harder to use the like gaijin card, I guess. Um, but in America, like I use this like hafu card, I guess, like more as like a not in a positive way like i do in J in japan more as like it's a negative thing where on the internet i get told that i'm like asian fishing or like told that i'm not like asian enough and that like i'm just like playing into this like role and that like i'm not a real japanese person i don't know if it's like political but like you know it's like i get told this by people who aren't like japanese or aren't in the asian community and it can get really frustrating at times and like they don't believe that i can actually speak the language yeah i guess like oh, also with um i guess another another card <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I was just wondering, like, being famous on TikTok or being known on TikTok, has ever given you any benefits in the in real life, like in Japan? Oh my gosh! Well, I get some DMs from different places sometimes, like uh, to go and do things for free, which has been really cool. Like, I've had like random, as of all things, like estheticians, like mostly slide into my DMs and they're like, do you want a free facial? And like, come down to like the Shinjuku area and like, I'll do it for free if you just post on your Instagram story. And I'm like, sure, but like, I, I don't know if this will appeal to my audience. They don't really care about like getting a facial. It's not really different from what they know. Um, but getting like sent candy, Japanese candy by like Japanese companies, which has been like really fun because I, I love snacks and I like getting free osembe. <laughs> so um, things like that. But I get most of my like perks from the American side. I think just because I have such a large American audience mm -hmm. um, and like foreigner audience that are interested in like Japan and learning Japanese. But I have been stopped by people in Japan, which has been cool. Um, but they're mostly like at like different events that there would be like people who aren't full Japanese or they're like foreigners. Um, but it's been cool. I, I, get, I freak out every time, like in a good way. Yeah, I guess it's like a, a bonus card beyond the yeah. the Gaijin card or the, or the half card. Is <laughs> We're just like looking at like a, a hand card. of deck of cards right <laughs> yeah. here. Like Amanda's big deck of cards. <laughs> 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 Yeah, yeah we have like half of a card like on our podcast with max d capo he just like knighted us honorary half japanese so like well, eric actually has a 10 percent japanese card on him so oh uh, yeah. it's one of those like uh, 23 of me tests that's what i said <laughs> <laughs> i want to take those so but i haven't done them yet there has to be some percentage of something other than japanese on my japanese side like just based on history alone it's like there's no way that it's like gonna be 50% like on the dot. So yeah, waiting on a sponsorship, you, honestly. 23 and me, where you at? <laughs> <laughs> the, the craziest, I feel like, situation out of all of it would be if your dad gives you a plot twist and you're actually more than 50% Japanese, then <laughs> let everyone know like, hey, 51%, what y'all gonna say now? Yeah, it's a majority <laughs> now for sure. <laughs> when your TikTok started blowing up, was there a particular one that blew up? immensely that you remember um so i started i have this like weird trajectory i had as a tiktoker i started out posting like 
random like acapella videos. So I would take like random things like the Wii Sports theme and like turning it into an acapella arrangement where I do I did all the parts by voice. So that was like the very first thing that blew up. And then I started just doing more random like random Nintendo sounds because they were nostalgic to me. And I unknowingly built up a following of people who really liked like Japanese culture because I guess game like Nintendo obviously is Japanese and it intersects with like gaming and things. And I just somehow landed on like making stuff about being in Japan because I spend most of the time that I have in Japan anyway. Um, and so naturally, I guess I just started making content about like random cool things that I would find in Japan because gratefully my audience was already like slightly uh, uh, interested in Japanese culture. And I just didn't know like those videos would also take off. So I was like, okay, I can talk about Japan and then like incorporate music still, but as long, but like make it Japanese related and really start to build a Japanese brand. I see. I guess, do you have like a plan for like future content if you're not in Japan? Mm -hmm. So a lot of my videos that do blow up, like are my, the two types of videos I guess that blow up for my account specifically are like things that are cool that I did in Japan, but also a lot of my videos that blow up are me taking popular sounds from TikTok and like doing them in Japanese. Like one of the ones I did that did really well was when We Don't Talk About Bruno from Encanto was everywhere. I just took the Japanese translation from Disney and I was like, this is what it sounds like in Japanese and sang it as a cover. And then that one really blew up. Like it got a lot of traction. Like it got on featured on the Oscars. Like it, it really went far and I just didn't expect it to do anything. I thought, oh, maybe this will get to like a hundred thousand. I'll be happy. But it did really well. So when I'm not in Japan, like that is definitely my go-to and I can rely on it and know that it'll do well. So even if I'm not in Japan, I can still provide content from anywhere in the world. Yeah, I actually remember watching, the one I really liked was the Stranger Things um, song. The, oh my um, gosh! <laughs> that one was, <laughs> was like pretty amazing. I saw that on my feet and I was like, oh man, this is like, this is incredible. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Earlier you mentioned that you had um, learn Japanese when you were over there um, taking care of your grandparents really to uh, to the next level um, at that point conversationally so I, I guess during that point um, what were some of the things that really helped you out obviously you were really immersed in the language but was there anything very specific in there that kind of helped you out to take those next steps like I say like I I'm from the south when I'm in America and so th there's no real like accessibility to like being around other people who speak Japanese. There's a very small Japanese community. It's grown since, but there is no real way for me to like learn Japanese or be around like Japanese culture where I lived in the States if I didn't like intentionally do it and like learn it on my own. And as a kid, no one wants to sit down and study. So I, I like, I, I didn't really try too much. Like I knew some words, but I really couldn't speak it. But by being immersed in Japan, I was really able to like pick it up um, just by being around it. One thing that really helped me was my mom sent me to Kumon once a week. Um, and so while everyone else was studying ahead, I was learning hiragana and katakana and a little bit of kanji. I don't know what they do at Kumon, but like I will never ever forget any kanji that I specifically learned there. But if I, if I took a college course, which I took a lot of college courses for Japanese, just so I could like brush up and learn more kanjis, I've, I've genuinely forgotten like 80% of what I learned in college, but those Kumon days with those games and those papers, like I will never forget any of that. Yeah, oh man, Kumon is, uh, I, I actually remember that. Yeah, <laughs> luckily my mom sent me with a friend, so it was like I got to hang out with my friend and do it next to her, so it was like not necessarily studying, it's like doing something with my friend, so. Yeah, and I, I guess that's one thing that kind of comes up a lot on our podcast is that when people take college classes or kind of just classes in general, um, nothing really sticks compared to immersion. And mm -hmm. immersion is really where a lot of the learning happens. And we see um, many extremes of um, language learning through immersion on the podcast, but it's always like super cool to see different, um, different backgrounds and different ways people have learned. So 
I mean, gotta add Kumon to the list now. <laughs> <laughs> Do they have Kumon yeah. for adults? They should. I'm trying to imagine it. that. Like, <laughs> it's like a, a, it's like all the kids are still there. They just have an adult section like right next door. And it's like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They bring out like the puzzle games from the child side. You got like a lady in an apron just like bringing you this child game. And like, here you go. Like, push these buttons and match these letters. <laughs> 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 what is the target age of Kumon? Like kindergarten to sixth grade, oh. I think. Yeah. At some point, it becomes Juku, and then it becomes sad. Right. You know, <laughs> in your head, you realize you're going to Juku. <laughs> but maybe if you really enjoyed it, then you go to the adult version. You sit in your really tiny desk, and you just sit there as a practitioner comes and says, All right, you guys have 60 minutes to complete these worksheets. Go. <laughs> they hand you like a fat pile, like this thick of worksheets. Of, <laughs> I, I guess maybe if you want to be immersed in Japanese, like maybe this is the the new um business here i don't want to necessarily say we're gonna have the korekara kumon but um I'm, I'm sure someone can make that happen someone you can, can make it fun get, you get they, candy they, at the end wow good candy. job your hard work yeah. exactly of well, speaking, hard of, candy. speaking of the end <laughs> might be time for the end of the podcast right. for the korekara message right. i think it is time for the one and only Korekara message. So I know this is something that you've been thinking about for a really long time, all the way out in Nashville, Tennessee, going all the way back and forth between Japan and now you being all the way in Japan before going to the next step, of course. But we know this entire time you've been writing down, carefully crafting this specific message. And I know all our listeners and viewers are ready to hear what it is. So Amanda, I'm gonna go put you on the spot right now. The lights are shining bright. Let's hear your Korekara message, potentially in Japanese. I'm going to do it in English. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what I've learned on the internet is nowadays a lot of people are saying you can't learn Japanese because you're not Japanese. Like that is so disrespectful. That's appropriation. That is a load of lies. If you love Japan, if you love the language, if you want to learn it, I don't care if you just want to learn it so you don't have to watch like anime with subtitles or something. I think anyone and everyone should learn Japanese if they want to. It's a lot of work, but it's worth it and it's fun. And do it, learn it. It's super rewarding. You'll love it. That's all. Nice. You love nice. to hear it. Thank you so much, Amanda, for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure and it's been a fun time. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. Hey guys, thanks for making it to the end of the podcast. Leave a comment if you made it all the way till here. And we want to quickly shout out our patrons, Cedric Ferros, Kevin Allen, Darren, Drew, Jack, Joey Cage, Nightmare, the MKXXN, Suzu, Yui, Christopher, Zach, and Sad, Sad Boy. Peace. Peace.